This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian, and I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. So prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide if the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers, because this film is lit. The Blackwoods have always lived in this house. We have never done anything to hurt anyone. We put things back where they belong, and we will never leave here. It's We Have Always Lived in the Castle, and this film is lit. Hello and welcome back to This Film is Lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We have a jam-packed episode with every single one of our segments, so we'll jump right in. If you have not read or watched We Have Always Lived in the Castle recently, here is a brief summary of the film. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. This synopsis is sourced from Wikipedia. 18-year-old Mary Catherine Maricat Blackwood lives on the family estate with her older sister Constance and their ailing uncle Julian. Constance has not left the house in the six years since she was tried and acquitted of the death of her parents by poisoning. Every Tuesday, Mary Cat goes to the village to shop while the strangers or while the villagers harass her. Mary Cat practices her own brand of protective magic by burying articles of power in the ground to keep evil forces at bay and protect Constance. Constance sees only a single family friend, Helen Clark, who comes to tea every week. Helen tries to convince Constance that she should rejoin the outside world. This enrages and terrifies Maricat, who creates magic to prevent Constance from leaving. On Thursday, Constance sends Maricat an, uh, on an errand to town. Maricat is distressed at the thought of going into town on the wrong day and has no time to check her magical safeguards. When she returns, she finds all of her wards have been unearthed. Before she can warn her sister, she is introduced to their estranged cousin, Charles. Over the next few days, Charles attempts to lure Constance away with the promise of seeing the world while setting his sights on the family fortune, locked in a safe. Constance is charmed and subservient towards him. However, Charles behaves condescendingly to Julian and taunts Maricat with the idea of stealing her sister. Maricat retaliates by casting magical spells on Charles, vandalizing his room and belongings, and speaking to him only in descriptions of poisonous plants. When Charles threatens to punish her, Maricat throws everything on his desk, including his lip pipe, into a wastebasket. Charles beats her until he discovers that his room is on fire. The fire department arrives along with the villagers who call to let the house burn down. Constance and Maricat hide downstairs as the fire is extinguished. The villagers then rush into the house and vandalize it. The mob seems ready to attack the sisters, but Helen Clark's husband announces that Uncle Julian has died of smoke inhalation. The mob disperses and the sisters take refuge in the woods. The following morning, the sisters return home and barricade the doors and windows. With the upper floors destroyed, the remains resemble a turreted castle. Maricat announces that she intends to poison the whole village, and Constance reveals that this is what Maricat did once, uh, once before to their parents and expresses gratitude that Maricat saved her from their wicked father. The villagers leave gifts of food at their doors and apologize for destroying their property, but the sisters never respond. Charles returns, begging Constance to let him in. When they remain silent, he enters the house by force and attacks Constance, and Maricat bludgeons him to death with a snow globe, and they, uh, they then bury him in the garden. In the present, the sisters are cleaning what remains of their house when two village children arrive to taunt them. Maricat steps outside, and the children flee in fear. Constance tells Maricat that she loves her, and Maricat, for the first time in the film, smiles. The end. That is a summary of the film. We do have one description for Guess Who, so let's do it. Who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. I used to try to draw her picture, with long golden hair and eyes as blue as the crayon could make them, and a bright pink spot on either cheek. The pictures always surprised me, because she did look like that. Even at the worst time, she was pink and white and golden, and nothing ever seemed to dim the brightness of her. Hmm. Okay, so this is in first person, so this is probably whoever our main narrator is. Uh, obviously talking seemingly, yeah, we're talking about a woman here, golden hair, eyes as blue as a crayon. 
I don't think I would describe her hair as old at golden, but she does have striking blue eyes. Uh, and when I say she, I'm talking about Constance. So my guess that this might be Maricat talking about Constance. I'll say this is Constance. You would be correct. Nailed it. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they nailed the, yeah, uh, Alex Daddario, or Alexandra Daddario I, has very yes. blue. Eyes is, eyes is blue as the crayon can make them, yes. for sure. So it definitely fits that. But yeah, her hair is darker. Yeah, she has like dark, gold. dark brown like hair. A, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that was, that was pretty easy. All right. I have quite a few questions. Let's jump into those. In was that in the book? Gaston, may I have my book, please? How can you read this? There's no pictures. Well, some people use their imagination. So this is a section where I ask questions uh, about stuff in the movie to find out if it came from the book. So one of the first things that jumped out to me, and I actually don't have as many questions as normal. I tried to keep it this time to more, I don't know, bigger, th I don't know, to bigger things that really stuck out to me. But uh, one of the things that, that stuck out to me early, mainly because of a specific shot, um, is that we see a lot of mushrooms early on. And, and this movie is kind of arranged. Uh, we start at the end and then we flash back and go through the week leading up to where the story started. And then we end there at the end of the film back in like the, you know, where the film started. But each of the days, there's like a little image that pops up over with the title card. Uh, and the first one we see is a drawing of mushrooms. And then uh, as Maricat is heading into town, we get this like split diopter. It, I, it, it's probably fake, but it looks like a split diopter shot of some mushrooms growing in their yard uh, as Maricat walks kind of towards the camera from the distance. Um, and so several things, several mushroom imagery illusions in the very beginning of this film. And I wanted to know if the anything with the mushrooms came from the book. So there aren't any illustrations in the text of this book, although the kind of like bio like biology textbook illustration mm -hmm. style of those title cards is pretty similar to the illustrations on the inside cover flaps of the the edition of the book that I have. Okay. I don't know if those are included in every edition of the yeah. book, but they're on the ones that I have. Um but within the text, mushrooms and especially poisonous mushrooms are referenced pretty frequently. Um in particular, Maricat does recite facts about poisonous mushrooms at Charles, yeah. as you mentioned in the summary. Yeah. So initially, I so obviously I, going into this, I had never seen this. I had never read this. So I didn't really know what took place in the story at all. But one of the things that I kind of knew from the trailer uh, and 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 the reason that I asked is that I was wondering if that mushroom stuff came from it because I, I think what we're doing here is going obviously for some symbolism. I, I did not know that it was like the whole thing with the the, the poisons and whatnot that we get into and we find out that Maricat like really likes poisons and that sort of thing uh, and kind of studies them or whatever. And uh, especially like poisons made from, cause it, we have, there's a conversation later where I think Constance says, you know, there's all kinds of plants around that yeah. they, she knows how to make poisons out of and that sort of thing. And so initially I didn't, I didn't take the mushrooms that way. I took them as especially the, what looks like a split diopter shot of the mushrooms with uh, Maricat in the background reminded me of this shot from a film called Blue Velvet, which is a David Lynch film where uh, the imagery of that shot is a very famous shot where the camera like slowly moves down. Like it starts on the rose. There's just, like these roses growing in a garden and it slowly pans down and we're kind of introducing the town. And then eventually the camera gets down and goes like into the grass. And then after it goes down into the grass, it gets to all these bugs mm -hmm. like in the grass. And it's uh, the film. I have actually haven't seen Blue Velvet. I just am aware of that shot. And the film itself, from what I understand, is about like this, the 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 dark, horrifying secrets within this idyllic uh, town. Yes. <laughs> so like you see all the flowers and the beautiful stuff on top, and then we get down underneath, mm -hmm. and there's all these insects. Uh, and I, similar idea, I, from what I understand of Blue Velvet, like that represents like the the, the dark things underneath yeah. the surface of the town. And so I was thinking this was probably alluding to a similar idea of <clears throat> secrets from the past things buried mm -hmm. kind of coming back to the surface and the mushrooms representing that and again the way that the the mushroom shot that we see in the film reminded me a lot of that blue velvet shot so i think that's definitely yeah i think that's a, a good interpretation of yeah. the use of mushrooms here yeah uh but yeah because at this point we have no idea about the poisons or anything like that mm -hmm. so so uh, my next question is as constants or not constants as uh Maricat goes into town she's like buying 
their supplies for the week, which I guess they don't eat very much. It's funny, which is actually kind of an interesting, fun thing that I think works really well. Is we see her go into town and get groceries, and she comes back with like one bag's worth of yeah. groceries. But then every time we see them eat, they have these sprawling, gigantic, right? Um, which they do grow. Yeah, they yeah. have at least. I I don't remember how much of the we talk about the garden in the movie. They do talk about in having the, a garden, in the book. Though. They it's pretty clear that they have like quite a large garden like they grow quite a bit of of food i think that's implied in the movie as well but even still it seems like they would have to purchase more groceries than they do maybe not i don't know Mm. but i thought that was kind of interesting to maybe allude to like the sort of a a, like a magical little i don't know anyways but they have uh she goes into town to get these groceries and all of the people in the town hate her them already and we again we don't know why at this point but we find out pretty quickly that they all think that uh, we find out that the the parents of Constance and Mariquette are dead, died in some sort of tragic murder. Uh, and then eventually we find out that Constance was tried for it and acquitted for vague reasons that aren't really like her yeah. acquittal. Were, were, you know, there isn't really reasons. It's a, somebody says something about her being too pretty or like, you know, yeah. like blah, blah, blah. But there's never really like a concrete reason giving for given for why she was acquitted. But so everybody in the town like suspects that they killed their parents and they they don't like them because they're the weirdos who live in the big manor on the hill uh, whose parents died mysteriously and they suspect them of murder or and specifically Constance of murdering them. And I wanted to know if that was kind of the setup for our story in the book. Yeah, that is one of the, the kind of main points of uh, contention <laughs> in the book. Uh, the vibe is kind of that the townsfolk like already did not like the Blackwoods. Yeah. Um, but it really ramped up following the murders. Yeah. Uh, so th- I'd mentioned it a little bit. Uh, well, I, I mentioned it obviously in the, in the summary that Maricat does magic. She, and, and the way she tends to do magic, um, that we see primarily is that she just buries, she gets, you know, trinkets of certain things from people or whatever, and then buries them in the yard kind of as like wards or spells or whatever. Um, and I wanted to know if that came from the book and what, which I assume it did, but, and what her, like what she was doing, if the book goes into more detail, cause the, the movie plays it pretty vague with like what she's actually doing there. Yeah. Obviously it's some sort of thing. And she, she alludes to the effect that it's to protect Constance, but it's never really explicitly stated what, what she's doing and why. So I wanted to know if there was, this is almost a lost annotation, but is there more <laughs> from the book going on there? Um, yeah. So Maricat practices, uh, the book doesn't, specifically call it this but it's it's called sympathetic magic Mm -hmm. um most notably something called correspondence which is based on the idea that you can influence a person or a situation based on its relationship or resemblance to another thing so for example in both the book and the movie she smashes the mirror in charles's bedroom to try to break his connection to that space to like eliminate him from the space. And the movie goes in a little more hard, I think on the idea that she's specifically trying to protect Constance. She is. Right. um, But in the book, it feels more like her goal is just protection in general. Um, At first from like the villagers slash the outside world. Yeah. um, And then later on more specifically, to try to get rid of Charles. Yeah. And that makes, that makes sense. And, and that is implied in the movie as well, but there is, I think there's like one specific line that, that I cued in on where she says something about Constance specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I assumed it was just like general protection kind of things. D- is there, is it implied in the movie? Cause I can't, it's interesting in the film. It's never really, I think you can, and I think it works really well. And I like that they do this. It's never really kind of, uh, concretely established one way or the other whether this magic actually does anything in the film or if it is just her own you know it's just a thing she does uh kind of out of her neurosis but like is it uh does the book ever like imply whether or not it works no it's kind of similar i would say in the book that it's there's not proof that it works, right? But, but the, coincidentally, but the it does coincidentally, kind of it kind of works. Corresponds to corresponds, like, yeah. And in terms of like things are okay for them when there are in place, and then after they all get dug up and stuff, things <laughs> go poorly and right. whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's no confirmation in the book, but the book does not also 
make a point of telling us that right. it doesn't work. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Which I, I thought that worked perfectly in the movie. And I, cause it, I think it plays a lot to the, just kind of the nature of that in, in reality of like how that, how the, the way that those spells tend to work is that they, how they work for the people who, and how they interpret them, the people doing them and that sort of thing. Uh, and I think the movie does a good job of not like ever explicitly saying like, Oh yes, magic is real. And this is like mm -hmm. a real thing. Or, this is just a thing that this person who is kind of unwell is doing. <laughs> uh, I, I liked that the movie just kept it vague in that regard. I thought it, I thought it worked for what the story was doing. Uh, but speaking of Charles, and I, I assume based on your answer from the last question that this is the case, but does Charles come to stay with them, their cousin Charles? Yes, Charles shows up pretty early in the book, uh, similar to when he shows up in the movie. Uh, and his backstory is that his parents... Um, their aunt and uncle had cut off ties with the rest of the family following the murders because so embarrassing. Right. Um, and then his reason for showing up is that his parents are now dead and he wants to reconnect with his cousins, i.e. steal their money. Yes. Yeah. Which we will ultimately kind of discover. And again, the movie never has that concretely stated at any point yeah. that that's his goal, but it becomes very obvious that yeah. that is. No, the book doesn't concretely state that either, but he yes. is very fixated on... Concerned about uh, the money. Yes, and concerned about the money and where is the money? Yeah. Where are we keeping the money? How right. much money is there? All of that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Charles becomes kind of the antagonist, the main antagonist, as he re-inherits kind of the father's role in the story. Uh, like literally wearing his clothes and sleeping in his room and all that sort of thing, which I, I thought was interesting and will lead to eventually kind of the end of what happens here uh, and what the story's doing. But uh, Maricat immediately does not like him, does not want him there, uh, knows he's up to no good and doesn't want this dude invading into her and, and Constance's space uh, and trying to steal away Constance because Constance is really the only person Maricat seems to care about. So does there, but there's this great scene in the movie that I want to know if it came from the book, because uh, the line's great, the delivery's great, the way it's performed by Sebastian Stan I thought was fantastic. But he walks into the kitchen as Maricat's standing there, and at this point, it, there it's kind of the tension has bubbled to the surface. He's aware that she doesn't want him there. there there's yeah. not like they're not pretending to like play nice anymore at this point in terms of like pretending to like each other or whatever. And uh, he, he gets some milk out of the fridge and he starts drinking it and he's just staring at her. And then he says this line and, and this line specifically, I wanted to know if it came from the book because the way it was delivered and just the line itself, I thought was great. He says, I wonder in a month from now, who will still be here, you or me? And there's just this big, long, awkward silence as he drinks milk and stares at her. I thought that scene was really well done um, and kind of horrifying. And again, really well acted by everybody in it. Uh, and I wanted to know if it came from the book. That line is from the book. Um, they made like a little tweak to it. It's not quite verbatim, um, but it is from the book. He's not calmly drinking milk when he says mm. it, but gotta love a nod to movie villains drinking movie milk. Villains do like to drink milk. They do. I don't know what that says about me because I like to drink milk, but. Maybe all movie <laughs> villains are from the Midwest. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. Uh, so, uh, one of the characters that we haven't really talked too much about yet is Uncle Julian, played by Crispin Glover. I love when Crispin Glover shows up in things, because he's just a weird guy who only takes the strangest roles, like, that's just what he does now. Uh, he's been a weird guy forever from everything I've ever seen, but he kind of, like, writes and directs his own movies that are very strange and unique, uh, and anytime he shows up in something, like, he just doesn't act in, unless it's something that he's really interested in doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought it was fun seeing him appear in this. Uh, and I thought he did a good job, but he's playing uncle Julian who is, was at the dinner that, uh, where Maricat and Constance's parents died. And he's the brother of J John Blackwood. Is that the yeah, father's he's name? The, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who, who, uh, was the father of Maricat and Constance. Uh, and he was also poisoned. And, and, and this is, I kind of lost in the adaptation. Does him being in a wheelchair because of that, poisoning it's or implied. was that prior to okay yes, that's what i thought that that's why he's in the wheelchair I, that's what i thought i just wasn't 100 percent sure if he maybe yeah. had been in before or whatever but he got poisoned slightly it just didn't kill him just a little poison just a little poisoned uh but all of his conversations in the film are incredibly strange and he kind of just talks nonsense most of the time he's writing a book about the blackwoods and about mm -hmm. specifically like the night they were killed and all that sort of stuff and he has all these notes about it and he's working on this story 
Um, but but beyond that, he also just kind of like says nonsense a lot. That's like vaguely relevant and related to like the Blackwoods history and stuff. But it's all very like kind of cryptic and strange. And I wanted to know if that his, his character was similar in the book in that he kind of just spouts nonsense and every converse and even beyond conversations, including him, just a lot of the conversations in this film in general are very odd. Odd. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to know if that was translated from the book or if the film is making those conversations more kind of off like strange mm -hmm. than they are. Okay. So uncle Julian is a pretty faithful adaptation from his book character. I think um, he is very like hyper fixated on the murders. Um, he's always rambling about them and collecting information for his book that he's been working on for six years, I guess he's not quite all there. Um, and they do this a couple times in the movie, but particularly in the book, he also gets confused about who people are. Feels like a little bit similar to like somebody who has dementia or yeah. Alzheimer's. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, where he like he gets Maricat confused for his wife. Um, he gets Constance confused for her mother, I think. Yeah. Um, and he like continually calls Charles by his brother's name, which infuriates Charles, which I think is the main thing that we see happen in the movie. Yeah, um, I don't even remember that, but yeah. We'll talk about that. I have a note or a, th a thought about... Anyway, sorry, yeah. continue. And now, I, it's left vague, so I'm not really sure if this is meant to be, like, from age or mental illness or if this or is a result of almost being poisoned yeah. to death or, like, a combination of those three. I don't really know what surviving attempted arsenic poisoning does to you. Yeah, I, so. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I have no idea. Um, but yeah, so yeah, their conversations are very strange. And I will say, I, I didn't really have a note anywhere else about it, so let's mention it here because I think it's relevant. Is that I, I overall, I thought this movie was interesting. I didn't love it. I, I, I don't even know if I liked it necessarily, mm -hmm. but I thought it was f interesting and mm -hmm. like well done in a lot of ways. But one of the issues I think I had with it uh, is that, uh, and maybe it's just a nature, like part of it's just an issue of like doing the podcast and taking notes maybe it would have worked better if i hadn't been also writing I, I but i don't think so so one of the issues i had with it is because all the conversations are so odd and they like they, they do it's almost like a mumblecore movie in the sense that they tend to talk over each other a lot more than in other movies i feel like yeah they, 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 it's a very natural like flow of conversation in the way they kind of step on each other's sentences and stuff and talk over each other like it's very realistic and natural, but it also makes it very hard to like follow what's always being talked about. And especially when Julian is saying all this stuff about the fan, like there were a lot of times where I wasn't sure what was said in not even that what was said, like I heard the words, but like I was having trouble parsing like what was being discussed and everything. And I think if I were reading the exact same conversation, it would work a lot better because in a film, if you miss what's going on in a conversation, you have to like pause and rewind it and watch a scene again. Whereas in a book, it and, and it's very disruptive to the experience of watching a movie. Whereas in a book, if you don't quite parse a, a paragraph, you just reread the right. paragraph yeah. again and it doesn't feel as disruptive to the experience of reading. I mean, it obviously can get annoying if you're doing it like constantly. And so I think that was one of my issues with the movie is that I think if I had read the book and had a grounding for everything that was going on. I think the film would have, I would have enjoyed the film more, I think. But as it was, I had a hard time at times, like I followed the overall general story pretty well, but at times some of the like little details that I feel like were probably important and interesting for like small characterization stuff. I had a bit of a hard time following because it was so dense and odd. I yeah. guess if that makes sense. I yeah, don't know. no, that that makes sense. And to answer your other questions, their conversations are also very strange in yeah. the book. I think there's a couple things that Shirley Jackson is kind of playing with here. At first off, obviously, there's the fact that no nobody in this family is okay. Yes, they're no, all. No one is doing well. They're all here. dealing with yes um, stuff. But then I, I think she's also playing on this kind of like stiltedness of um like a very traditional like kind of old money upper right. crust family yes. where nobody really says what, what they, they mean, mean yeah. and everything is kind of like couched yeah um and and hidden 
And, yes. and I think I think we're playing with that as well. I think that as well. And then on top of that, they their conversations are odd and stuff because they're also just not social. Like they're yes. literally the only people they <laughs> yeah. interact with are their family members. Like they're not socialized like at all. A constant or Maricat goes out <laughs> into society once a week for a couple yeah. hours. And Maricat is like semi feral, yes. basically. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely, yeah, there's a lot going on there. And, and again, I think it works and it creates this very odd feeling. And I think it like the kind of like it works on a I don't want to say a world building level, but like an ambient like mm-hmm. level uh, of of making kind of the whole film feel strange it's and off putting the vibes, the vibes, man. Yes. Yeah. But it did, I feel like slightly hamper my ability con- to connect with not only the narrative, but also thematically, like what the characters I, of connecting with the characters and like what they're saying and like what they're going through. The fact that I was having a hard time occasionally following some of the conversations and that, that I would have needed to literally pause and rewind and watch them again and maybe even watch them with subtitles uh, made it. And again, it wasn't a huge issue. It was just a handful of scenes where it made me feel like I was missing and or made me wonder if that was maybe why I didn't connect with the story quite as much as I was hoping I would. And again, it's not that I didn't connect with it at all or get anything out of it. Cause I did and I enjoyed it, but it was, I, I think I would have, it would have worked better if I had been able to like follow all of the minutia of their conversations, uh, which I think I would have been able to, if I had been reading it or if I watched it again, I guess, but I don't know. Anyways. Okay. So my next question move moving forward a little bit, we get uh, things have tensions have risen even more uh, uh, between Charles and Maricat specifically to the point where Charles has actually like attacked her because she uh oh, she did something I don't remember what she well, I don't remember why he why did he attack her um I think at this point she oh is this because she has all the she puts all the stuff in his bed and whatnot that's part of it but we're like past that she comes into dinner and. Uh, Constance tells her to go wash her hands and she goes and like watches the faucet run for a few minutes and then comes back to dinner. Um, She probably I think she's just like this is one of the scenes where she's like spouting mushroom facts. Oh, okay. And he gets like progressively more angry until he pops. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah. But anyway, so he he, like literally physically is like attacking her and like dragging her. uh, or She's like running away from him and he's like chasing after her and like grabbing her and yelling at her. And uh, after this transpires or right before this transpires, uh, Maricat had was already mad, mad at him and she ran upstairs and she uh, dumps all of his stuff in uh, like a trash can. And uh, I, I, it's hard. in the movie, you can't really tell if she does this on purpose or if it's just an accident, but she throws a pipe in there and it turns out the pipe was lit mm-hmm. and then it starts a fire. Uh, and it ends up like burning most of uh, all of the belongings and like a lot of their upstairs level of the house. Um, but specifically uh, starts a fire in Charles's room, which is their former father's room. Cause he's staying in the same in that room. Uh, and I want to know if that came from the book. If she, if she burns their father slash Charles's room. Um, yes. I don't think it was her intention to burn half the house down, but she did, in fact, start the fire. Does it seem in the book that she starts the fire intentionally? Yes. Okay. Okay, because, again, in the movie, I think it you could kind of read it whether yeah. or not. It's hard to tell like, whether or not it, you think it was intentional that she. You, you could probably squeak out an unintentional reading in the book, maybe. But it, to me, seems pretty clear that she did, like, was aware yeah. that she was starting a fire, but maybe thought that it was not going to be. Right. that big of a fire or thought it would like stay contained to his room. Yeah. And I think the basically. same, I think it's the same in the film that it, you know, most likely she did it intentionally, but it's hard to tell. Cause just the, the way the framing of the shot, we only see the trash can and we see her throw the stuff in there. And it, you know, we don't, it's hard to tell. There might be a shot where she looks at the pipe. I don't know. Anyways, I think it's implied that she probably intentionally started the fire in the film. I just can't remember if it's, you know how how explicit that implication is but anyways she she burns this fi- uh, the thing down and then as uh, the fire starts the people in town see it call the fire department the volunteer fire department shows up and starts putting the fire out and as the fire's getting put out uh the villagers all show up as well to watch this because you know it's a small town and this is interesting High going entertainment. on. yeah 
they gotta go watch the Blackwood Manor burn. And then they get there, they're all like, hey, you guys should just let it burn because these people suck. And then after the fire does get put out, they decide to like vandalize the place. Uh, and they, they like break in and start like breaking windows and knocking furniture over and all kind of and stealing stuff and whatnot. And I wanted to know if the villagers come and vandalize the Blackwood estate after the fire. Um, and if, if like what you think, why that occurs. <laughs> Um, so d yes, they do come and vandalize the house after the fire. Um, mob mentality takes over pretty quickly while everyone is like gathered yeah. around watching the house burn. And then you have the one guy, like the fire chief yeah. guy throws the first rock through yeah. the window and then just like the tidal waves right. break. Right. Um, uh, and then after that, I, well, my other question that I had here that I forgot to mention was, after that, they then, uh, after they vandalize a bunch of stuff and they leave, they come back over the next, like, week or so and they, like, bring gifts and they, like, kind of apologize by, like, giving the, like, leaving gifts outside the home. Um, and I, I also wanted to know if that came from the book because I thought that was also an interesting little detail. Yes, the townspeople do end up bringing, like, food and things for them. Uh, at first, feels like they just really... You know, in the light of day, they feel bad uh, yeah. for the actions that they took. Um, but we actually see like a bit more time pass in the book, like enough time for vines to like completely grow over the house. Mm. And as time passes, the sisters start to become part of like the local folklore and people are leaving things for them out of like superstition, fearful respect, whatever right. you want to call it. Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. My next one was, uh, is it revealed in the book? Because this whole time, we, you know, the story has been that, oh, Constance was tried for uh, poisoning her parents, and everybody knew she did it, but she was acquitted for, you know, whatever X, Y, Z reasons. That's never made super clear, but just the implication being that she's too pretty, too young, whatever. Um, so we just let her off because it would be a shame to lock her up or whatever. But it is revealed later in the story that, in fact, it wasn't Constance that poisoned their parents. It was Maricat. Um, and this is like kind of a, a surprise reveal, not surprising, at least surprising reveal at all. If you've been watching the movie to this point, in my yeah. opinion, because it's very clear one that Constance or that Maricat, well, several things. One, Constance is not capable of that. Two, Maricat, very capable of that, seems to be kind of a sociopath. Also, uh, to at least to some extent, in my opinion, uh, at least the way she's portrayed in the film. Uh, also talks about poison all the time, yeah. <laughs> like literally mm -hmm. just like quoting poison pamphlet stuff to uh, to Charles all the time. Uh, and it just, it, it just seemed very obvious to me that that was what was going on there. Um, but is that also kind of a reveal? Is, is that what happens in the book? And is it kind of treated as a reveal? To be fair, the movie, it doesn't treat it as like some gigantic, like big twist or anything, but it is a slight like kind of surprise reveal. It is the same in the book. Um, I would say that the text treats it not as a reveal, but as a confirmation of what you've already suspected to be the truth. I would say the film does the same. Thing. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, there is evidence against Constance. She's the one who made the food. She does know about like plants and poison right. as well. But yeah, if you've read the book, watched the movie, you know that Constance is not capable of this doesn't seem like mary cat least, no. very much so very much yes and then my other kind of question related to that is is it part of this reveal in the film is that uh constance knew this the whole time because I, I could also see it where it's revealed that like constance either was lying to herself or either or just truly didn't know because she's so naive or whatever that that mary cat poisoned their parents and that maybe constance just didn't know who did it or thought some of some weird accident or who knows but no it's revealed that mary cat or that constance knew that mary cat did it and i wanted to know did that ask does that angle of it come from the book that she kind of knew the whole time yes okay um at first we get like a very similar scene to what we see in the movie where mary cat talks about wanting to poison the entire village and Constance says, like you did before. Mm. And Mary Cat responds, like I did before. Yeah. Which is the first confirmation um, of what we already knew. And then later they have kind of a more direct short conversation about it. And Constance says, I know. I knew then. Okay. 
Uh, well, I have a s different question here because I don't know if you have this. Do you have anywhere else the motivations, a discussion of the motivation behind that? I don't, but we can talk because I want to talk now. about it because this is actually something I read today. I was reading. I just I was on the IMDb page uh, to get oh to get the quote for the beginning. And I read the review that was up was somebody complaining about a change from the book to the film. And the thing they were complaining about was that they didn't like that the film added a motivation for that that according to them was not in the book. So in the film, we it, it, it's never explicitly stated, but it is alluded to the fact that that Mariquette killed uh, their parents specifically to kill John Blackwood because and I, again, my my interpretation of it is that he was sexually abusing. That Constance. was also the vibe that I got from the movie. Yes. Okay. And this person, this reviewer was upset that they added that motivation to Mariquette killing their parent or that backstory to to Constance having been abused by the father. And, well, to be fair, it I, I think you could go either way. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual abuse, but whatever. Abusing mm -hmm. Constance in some capacity, physically, emotionally, sexually, something. I, again, to me, I interpreted it as like, he was sexually abusing her. Um, but I, I guess there's not really anything explicit in the film that would make that super right. like clear other than some lines and, and just kind of the, the language of how films talk about that. And there's like a line about him being like a it's, wicked man. It's or definitely something. very in line with the way that media tends to talk about sexual yeah. abuse. Yes. But it is not explicitly yes. stated to be that in the Anyways, film. Um, so in, I guess my question is, does the book have anything like that as to what the motivation for, for Maricat killing the parents was, or she just killed their parents? So I'm going to say yes, but also no. Okay. Um, the film is definitely much more direct and on the surface about giving Mary Cat that motivation. Yeah, of like right? protecting Constance. Yes, from of like protecting Constance, um, getting rid of her parents because they were abusive or the father was abusive. And, and the mom didn't stop or whatever. Yeah. Right. Something, yeah. And none of that kind of explicit confirmation of those things or semi explicit implied confirmation, confirmation implied yeah. confirmation it's tough to talk about because even yeah. in the film it's not explicit it's no yeah but, it, it, but no, it's it, very obvious what they're alluding to. yes so none of that implied confirmation comes from the book so the reviewer is correct about that okay however i personally would not say that there is zero implication of that okay so you think you could book. get that reading from i the think book. i could get that reading from the book was that the reading you got from the book or had you not really thought about it before the film? That was not the reading that I got the first time reading the book. The second time reading the book, it jumped out at me a little more. Okay, that's interesting. So a couple points here. There's quite a bit of talk throughout the book of Maricat being frequently punished yes. by her parents. Yeah. And there's another thing, and and it's very subtle. And you could read it multiple ways is is kind of the the sticking point here. Right. You can read it multiple ways. Sure. But Constance throughout the book will repeat this refrain of it being all her fault mm. of what happened being all her fault. Right. When we know. Yeah. And Constance uh, knows, yeah. and Maricat knows that ultimately she did. is not the one yeah. who murdered their parents. Yeah. And that's m honestly more of the red herring than anything else in the book. Yeah. Is that she's constantly repeating this refrain of like, it's all my fault. I think she it's does all say that fault. in the film as well at some point, I think. My interpretation of that yeah. no, <laughs> is I agree. that Constance sees, you know, either Maricat did this to protect her or. Because she failed to protect Maricat from their parents, this is ultimately what ended up happening. I see a lot of like that, like oldest sister, oh, eldest yes. daughter psychosis yeah. in Constance and feeling responsible for something that happened to your younger siblings is a huge part of that. Yeah. Well, and I think even beyond that, just the, the her saying it's all because I, I think just another like kind of more surface level way to interpret that is just that she blames herself for because, you know, so so I guess that's another layer that I, I forgot that, that I didn't mention is that, yes, on top of 
whatever happened to Constance that Maricat was killed her parents to protect them. Maricat was also mistreated by her yes. parents. Yeah. But what I was saying is that I think the uh, the part the part of Constance saying it's all my fault, I think it's also just a kind of like her uh, reinforcing a victim blaming narrative. Let's say she were being sexually abused. Mm-hmm. Her saying it's all my fault. Maricat finds out about it. Maricat kills their parents uh, because she knows that her father is abusing Constance. It seems like a perfectly understandable reaction for Constance to 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 yeah. blame herself for either not like stopping her father or for or for blaming herself for telling or for you know let's say maybe she told Maricat or something um for not keeping that secret from Maricat for putting Maricat into a situation where she felt the need to kill her parents yes all of these things are very much like yes uh kind of self-blaming uh victim blaming um you know, uh, mindsets that Constance has clearly um, taken upon herself, which makes sense within the the time period this is, which this takes place, which in the film, it's intentionally vague. Like it could be 10 years ago or it could be 50 years ago or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think that is, yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. I, I think her blaming herself in that way definitely implies there was something Mm-hmm. going on yeah no i i agree 100%. and you know and that's why i say yes but also no yeah because the book is definitely not as heavily alluding yes. to it as the film is but there's not nothing there's not there. nothing there okay okay interesting interesting uh my final question was or for was that in the book is uh i wanted to know if the story ends with constance uh, they everything's happened now and this is uh, this is what the final line in this the wikipedia summary said they they Maricat scares a couple of the <laughs> shithead kids away uh, and then uh, they decide they're going to bake a pie and they joke about eating kids or whatever and then Constance tells Maricat that she loves her and in the film and I, I think this is true I'm trusting Wikipedia here that <laughs> at the end of the final shot of the film is after Constance says I love you Maricat smiles for the first time that we've seen in the film and I think that is accurate I think I don't know. Again, I'm trusting Wikipedia, which is not, as we've discussed (laughs) numerous times on here, in terms of movie synopsis, movie summaries, it's not always accurate. Um, But I wanted to know if the book ended similarly. Yes, but also no. Okay. Again, um, so at the end of the scene in the book is a similar scene to where, like, there's the kids kind of taunting them and then they get scared off um, and the two sisters joke about well what if we what if we did eat kids and constance is like i don't think i could cook one yeah um but the book actually ends with maricat saying oh constance we are so happy Mm. and end scene yes okay i like that it's a very similar where it's yeah kind of similar kind of a similar idea of them uh being happy maybe Mm. Uh, uh in this uh in this new in their isolated in their castle that they will always live in uh, okay i do have some more questions uh that we'll get into some more stuff in lost in adaptation just show me the way to get out of here and i'll be on my way wow was lost yes yes and i want to get unlost as soon as possible so this was confusing to me in the film and this to me feels maybe like a failure of direction or editing or something a little bit in this scene because i really did not realize, could not put together what was going on here. Or at least I, I I could put together what I thought was going on, but I don't think the movie did a good job of showing that or whatever. But there's a scene where it, uh, Helen, I think it's when Helen... Helen Clark comes over for tea and she brings Mrs. Wright. Yeah. Who was an uninvited, unannounced guest. Yeah. And there's this scene where Julian is there and then he goes, he takes the other woman... Mm -hmm. uh her friend into the other room where like the dining room where where they died and where they had the dinner or whatever he's like explaining a little bit yeah he's doing like this macabre show and tell yes exactly and but as this is happening they're sitting in the other uh maricat and constance are sitting in the other room but then at one point he says something and like constance responds to him and i couldn't so is that scene from the book and is what's going on there? I like, I, I was just, I think it's just poorly 
like a st- like we were missing some establishing shots. I don't know. I think yeah. I think this like from the the filmic language doesn't do a good job portraying like exactly what's transpiring. Could they hear Julian in the other room? Is that what's I guess maybe being implied? Because it didn't seem like it. But then when they started responding, it's like okay, well they must be able to hear him. I just thought that scene was strange and maybe that's intentional. Like, I don't know, like some of the off puttingness, I do wonder if like some of that's intentional and some of the, but uh, maybe I'm giving too much credit there. I don't know. Uh, but what's going on there? Do you know? <laughs> so that scene is from the book and in the book, it's very clear that they can just hear what he's saying okay. in the dining room. I guess that's what's going on. It's just on. the next room over. They like open right. a door and go through from the parlor into the dining room. Right. And that makes sense for some reason, something about the way it was shot, yeah did not translate that to me directly like i again i kind of guessed that was what was going on but it didn't feel clear to me that that was what was going on um again which maybe could have been intentional but i don't think it was um anyways okay so that was just a weird like kind of generic question but um and and this kind of ties back to what i was saying earlier but so julian's i i couldn't understand what his angle was throughout most of the film and i think ultimately i kind of got to the point i was like okay well his angle is just that he's on like crazy like yeah. it doesn't Deep, really deeply unwell yeah okay and that's fair but i was like for initially i was wondering if he had like a motivation that was going like the whole dynamic between him and like constance and maricat was so strange because he is seemingly does he think one of them killed them does he think they're responsible like constance was responsible for the death or like what does he think and know and why does he still live with them i guess because he can't really go anywhere yeah, else i don't think he really has anywhere else to go and that's fair but there wasn't as much animosity but there was some i was just having a hard time parsing like what the dynamics between them were and i, I think that was made more complicated by the fact that he's just kind of lost it yeah and I, I think you're supposed to kind of be confused by the family dynamic okay i think it's supposed to be weird and unsettling yeah because it, uncle julian the question of whether or not he thinks one of them did it is interesting um, because he'll say like at, at multiple points throughout the book, he'll kind of like list all the evidence that's against Constance. He'll right. be like, oh, she prepared the food, yeah, yeah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But then he'll be like, she was acquitted. Yeah. they. My, my niece was acquitted. Hmm. Okay. I don't think he knows up from down that's fair I, I i agree with that i i think that's i think that's true uh so my next question for this was that uh there's this line in the film uh where after something transpires where like i think it's like a, a disagreement with charles or something uh maricat runs out of the house and goes and sleeps she has this uh place in the in like the yard in the in, on the lawn where she has like dug a small hole or something it looks like uh, and she sleeps in it and when she gets back Constance says oh you slept in your crater on the moon didn't you and there's conversations throughout the film several times where Maricat says she wants to take Constance to the moon and she's like blah 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 and we see the moon a lot throughout the film Uh, one of the title cards like I mentioned earlier with the mushrooms one of them has the moon on it so we see the moon a lot and I wanted to know if the moon imagery came from the uh if from the book and like what you think it is and what it's doing and also Maricat sleeping in a hole in the yard is that in the book is is it just like she's kind of neurotic and ocd and all these things and like what's what's going i have just i know it's like a <laughs> hodgepodge of questions okay but. Uh, i did my best to answer your, your hodgepodge of questions here Maricat is absolutely a deeply neurotic person yes i think at bare minimum she probably qualifies for ocd paranoia and agoraphobia yeah which only feeds constance's agoraphobia and anxiety yes because constance very clearly has agoraphobia there's there yes. they have conversations about how like she like one of the scenes she's like oh like uh, look how far i made it out into the yard or whatever yeah. like she's like proud of you know the fact that she got further away from the house than she's ever been and stuff like that so yeah that's very clear and and also feels the exact same with america and again the paranoia and the ocd like specifically like the like anytime her routine is interrupted in terms of like the like when she goes into town and all that she gets very upset about that yeah and and that kind of thing and and, but i really enjoyed how the narrative commingled those things with her witchcraft Mm -hmm. i thought was very interesting yeah uh so in the book merrick hat frequently references wanting to go to the moon slash wanting to take constance to the moon I don't recall that Constance ever refers to Mary Cat's hiding spot in the woods as her crater in the moon. Mm. I think that's a movie edition. Okay. I don't remember that being in the book at all. 
I think the moon symbolizes Mary Kat's idea of like a perfect, perfectly safe place for her and Constance. And obviously there are a, a lot of ways to interpret lunar imagery. Uh, there's a the rich history right. of, of folklore and symbolism there. In this instance, I'm not sure it symbolizes much more than like safety and being thoroughly removed from the world. I would completely agree. I think that's exactly what it's doing. It's 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 there. It's a it's a place they can imagine where they could go and live that is um, completely private, completely safe, as mm -hmm. you said, uh, where they wouldn't have to be around any other people because nobody else on yeah, the moon. Very thoroughly removed um, from everyone. Yes, but it's also bright and seems beautiful like at least you know as you're looking at it from the earth and that sort of thing so yeah it's it's kind of like this it's the gray havens or whatever yeah from the, yeah it's, <laughs> it's this kind of unattainable um happy place that they wish they could go live that obviously they cannot so they must remain in the castle uh and then my final question is just kind of more broadly about thematically like what you got from this um, because I, I thought the film was interesting. I was expecting to get more explicit, uh, kind of, I don't know, to come away with a more explicit message. And the film is touching on lots of things. It's touching on trauma and, um, mental illness, honestly, to some extent and, and all these different things. Um, but it doesn't really feel to me like it has like a whole lot of like a message necessarily. Um, but so I was interested to see what you got from the book and the movie. Because ultimately to me, when it wrapped up and then like the final scene with like the little kid and they scare him away and they like joke about eating like kids. I was like, this whole thing, just like a witch origin story. <laughs> That's all this is, right? This is just like a it's actually kind of interesting because I was like, oh, OK, so all this was was like a fun, like writing exercise of like, all right. So we it, like imagine whatever town you grew up in has this myth about these scary women who live in the house on the edge of town. That's all like decrepit and like half burned down or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, we get to see the events that led up to, or mm -hmm. at least some of the events and the story that led up to, um, you know, the, the myth that became the, you know, the weird witches or whatever that live in the house on the, on the outs outskirts of your town. And so it is kind of just feel like the origin story of like a folklore of like a, a myth, a legend, uh, some folklore or whatever. But I thought it was interesting. But what I thought was extra interesting is that it's not a particularly sympathetic one. Or, yeah. Like it's not like because what you could imagine what I kind of almost imagined it would be not that it's not sympathetic at all, but that I was almost imagining it that it was going to be when I when, or when we finished the film, I was like, I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't a more like if what you're doing is writing a witch origin story. I, I would even imagine what Shirley Jackson was going to do with that would be to take. And I say this not having read anything of her, so I don't know why I would assume this, but I was kind of expecting thinking that for it to be a thing that was like, like the people in the town misinterpreted them or like were wrong about them or that they weren't like evil or bad in the ways that the town's yeah. people think. But they're actually kind of are. Uh, they actually, are, yes, the the villagers are kind of correct. They're kind of correct. They respond poorly in some ways, but they're not like wrong about yeah. like what is transpiring. And Marikat is kind of like a sociopath who wants to kill people, like for reasons in some way. Like I don't know. It's very interesting. And again, I think it's what makes it compelling and really interesting uh, and a fun watch and and fun to think about and, and kind of chew over after the fact. Um, but it wasn't really what I was expecting, which was, I guess, interesting in its own way. Anyways, what did you get from this story? <laughs> I so I is do, it a witch origin story? I, I do think that witch origin story is part of this novel's genre function. Uh, it's very firmly American Gothic, right? And the old witch who lives in a creepy house at the edge of town is very much part of American folklore. Mm -hmm. Digging a little deeper, let's think back to our learning things segment on Shirley Jackson. We know that she struggled with severe anxiety, other ailments and mental illnesses for most of her life, as well as pretty severe agoraphobia later in life. We also know that she felt ostracized and unwelcome in her small New England town that she lived in. I think at its heart, the novel is an exploration of those things. Yeah, I think the novel has a lot of themes. I don't know if it necessarily has an explicit message. I would agree that it doesn't. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you're right that the, the story is not particularly sympathetic to the girls. It's not, not sympathetic. It's not, not to sympathetic. Them. It's it, yeah. But 
you know, it's, it's not overly sympathetic. It's not like, oh, you were wrong about them or, oh, you like, because yeah. the, the, like you could imagine a version of the story where the message is, uh, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Actually, all these people were wrong to like mm-hmm. um, to assume these girls like murdered their parents or or they didn't realize the reason why they killed their parents, which there is like, a you know, at least some fairly justifiable like, you you know, depending on how you want to categorize it, it kind of self-defense in a way or something like it's complicated, but like there was a reason behind why it happened and that sort of thing. And, and it isn't just, but I, 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 you know, the fact that you framed it in, in reference to like kind of almost being uh, not autobiographical, but uh, you know, relating to a lot of things going on in uh, Shirley Jackson's life, I think actually makes it more compelling and interesting that they aren't, treated super yeah. completely sympathetically like if she sees a lot of herself in that character or in those characters i think that it makes sense that i think a person who could write this kind of story couldn't be someone who viewed themselves that sympathetically like i yeah. imagine no, shirley I, jackson I, probably I don't think dealt shirley with a great jackson amount of, liked herself yes yeah, self-loathing and self yeah um you know uh it, that sort of thing so like i insecurity and stuff so i can imagine that yeah that that actually makes it make a lot more sense of 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 sort of like a she's exploring the reasons why she is the way she like shirley jackson in this instance Mm -hmm. i think you could you could view this as a way of her exploring kind of the way she is why the way she is (laughs) exploring why she is the way she is um and it's and it's kind of just an honest i guess as honest as any self-exploration like that could be kind of examination of it that isn't like doesn't let herself off for Mm -hmm. like what is going on in her life ness i don't know it's interesting yeah yeah it is really compelling it's just i think the thing that that i found uh, lacking in the film is just that i i it it felt kind of i well and i mentioned this earlier when we were talking about it i i think the thing that i the, the reason it didn't really completely work for me is that i just had a hard time emotionally connecting with the characters in the film as much as Mm -hmm. i wanted to i guess Uh, and it's not that i didn't at all it's just that i i think that i i struggled at times to kind of find the emotional core of the film and so ultimately it just felt almost more of like a documentation of these strange events that i was it was almost like watching like a documentary it's obviously not remotely in that style but where it's it's just sort of like I don't know, and we, and we talked about one of the other things like maybe what would have made it work better for me is if we had been more told from the point of view or from the perspective of Constance, whereas it's we're primarily follow Maricat for the most part. We hear her yeah. it's her voiceover we hear at times in the film, uh, like her narration. And because I wonder if because she is kind of like a sociopath, I, th- I don't know. I don't know how to categorize it, but she seems maybe uh, to be kind of like a sociopath or something. Um, if that made it hard to connect emotionally for me to the story. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, maybe. Um, You know, I think we could also take it back to genre because this is gothic fiction. And, you know, you talked earlier about, like, the mushrooms and the bugs and, like, zooming in down on, like, the rot. The seedy rot underneath. That that lays beneath the The, surface. And that's kind of... A, a good summary of what gothic fiction is yeah. it's about the rot under the surface right so you're not really gonna find bright shining examples of, <laughs> of uh, protagonists in yeah. gothic fiction you kind of end up with like you know there are characters you can identify with maybe sometimes there are characters you can occasionally sympathize with yeah but it is kind of about like everybody's not super great here yeah and i guess that's the thing is that maybe that's why i didn't connect to the movie as much and 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 i think it's kind of intentional is that the movie and it goes back to what i was saying a bit almost being documentary like where it's it's almost like we're just kind of documenting uh like a horrifying train accident and it's not Mm -hmm. really anything to emotionally connect with in that like it's like that's not (laughs) it's not what the story's trying to do at all it's more so just look at these and it is kind of and you know what it's it's it you know what this is reminding me of a little bit of our discussion of high rise Mm. where i was like i like a lot of the elements of this i think the performances are great i think but like i had a hard time connecting with 
like kind of what it was doing. And it's a similar thing where it ultimately feels a little cynical that this feels different. It doesn't feel cynical in the same way that like, or not cynical, sorry, uh, nihilistic in the same way that yeah. um, high rise was, but it is kind of similar in that it, it does feel a little nihilistic kind of just about humanity in general, where again, nobody, everybody kind of sucks somewhat in certain yeah. ways. Um, and, and really it all just boils back to the fact that, um, people suck and trauma causes more trauma and like you know that's kind of just like what it's about and like yeah bad things happen to people and then they end up kind of leading shitty lives because of it and it's like okay great you know but yeah like that is what it's doing and i think it, i guess it works well in that regard like i said i think it's a good movie i just didn't i don't know i don't know if i yeah Anyways, all right. Sorry, I, I'll, I'm done talking now. It's time to find out what Katie thought was better in the book. You like to read? Oh, yes. I love to read. What do you like to read? Everything. Okay, so the first change that the movie made that I really didn't care for was uh, when Maricat is in town getting the groceries and she stops by the diner for a cup of coffee. Um, which she does as a way of letting the townspeople know that she's not scared of them. Mm -hmm. She like stops in and has a cup of coffee every time she goes. And the police chief guy or the fire chief, whatever, comes in. And Maricat tells us this backstory that he had been in love with Constance, but that uh, Maricat told their father about it. And the father like didn't, let him run away with Constance or yeah, something. something yeah. And I didn't really care for that. It's kind of the entire point that the villagers hatred and cruelty isn't actually personal. Right. It's just they're, they're hating the idea, the idea of, of the black woods. Yeah, not, There's not like personal beef going right. on. They don't here. have like a history of like, Oh, somebody he like, he didn't slight somebody on a business deal or something yeah. like that's not. Yeah. Although that is mentioned in the movie too, isn't it? Actually, that exact thing. Now that I say that, I think somebody a, a, doesn't somebody say that like Blackwood, like the stair thing. Yeah, the guy who like fixed their oh, stair. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, which is gone into a little bit more in the book, and it turns out he didn't actually fix their stair. Which is or what at least in the film that's too, what yeah. Mary Cat says. Well, it's seemingly not because what's his name? Yeah. Still Charles. He's is still he's trying fix to fix it. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I thought there was not enough Jonas the cat in the movie. Mm, is that the cat? I didn't even notice yes. that. But I didn't uh, really Jonas the cat, that. who looks just like Grindy, it does in look the just movie. like our cat Grindy, like just literally like Grindy. identical. He's got a almost. little white Those spot in the exact same on his place. chest. Yeah, a black cat with a little white. Spot. Uh, Grindy watched the entire movie with us. Yes, and, and every time Jonas went, he went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Katniss was not fooled, but Grindelwald yeah. was. Yeah. Well, he was he was very sleepy, so he's a little out of it. Yeah. So I'm not sure he, his <laughs> senses weren't at their peak. So anytime he heard anything that sounded like a cat, he was like, "What?" Huh? Um, anyway, I thought there was not enough of the cat in the movie. I was I I was not worried about. Well, actually, I was only worried because I was like, maybe the movie changed it. But I was like, you 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 didn't seem worried about the cat, so I was like, the cat must not die in the book because <laughs> otherwise, you would have been as soon as we saw the cat, I would have known because you would have been like uh, emotionally fraught already. And so I was like, the cat must be fine, which it is. Yeah, so. the cat is just FYI. If you're yes. thinking about reading this or watching this, the cat is totally fine yes. throughout the entirety of the book and the movie. Yes. Thank you, Shirley Jackson. Yeah. Uh, I also, I didn't really care. It's a good thing that Mike Flanagan didn't adapt this one. Because that cat would have fucking died if he had. God. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I also didn't really care for the scene in the movie where Charles is like in the bath and then he gets out of the bath. Okay. I almost and, and I almost Constance asked about is, this scene. Is in his room and he like intensely stares her down and like walks her backwards out of the room. I thought it was just weird. I it, I guess it's supposed to be unsettling and it was, yeah. but I wasn't really sure of what to make of it in the moment. No, I felt the same way. I was like, so what's going on? I was here? like, I don't I'm not sure what you're wanting me to get from this yeah because it well because obviously the movie throughout kind of builds up that they're like even though he's her cousin they building up this romantic relationship very slowly over the course of the film 
and it becomes very clear that like you know he's into her and she kind of seems into him uh which i think also is kind of reinforces the fact that we're put off by that and we're like eh, this is weird because mm-hmm. it's his cousin also i think reinforces kind of what we're supposed to get and and from the implication about what the relationship between right john or the father yeah. and her was and because especially since we're told repeatedly that, that he looks just, just like, like him father. and is literally wearing his suits and stuff yeah. at different points in the film and sleeping in his bed yeah like we're so i think that's also what's going on there but but to your point that specific scene still felt like, I wasn't really sure what... Yeah. Like, was it just to be unsettling and creepy? Because... Kind of seems like it. Because, like, what was... Because tra- the thing that makes it confusing is, like, what is John's motivation in that... Or Charles's, not John. Yeah. What is Charles's motivation yeah, in like, that Yeah, like, what scene? is he hoping to Because he's trying to woo there. her. He's trying to, like, win her over... Yeah. So that he can take their money. Like, does and... he think he's seducing yes, her that's in what that I mean. moment, like... but he just scares her? Yes. Because it doesn't, he does he seems like he's just acting kind of scary. It seems like he's being intimidating, but, yeah. but why would that be what his, why would he do that in that scene? Yeah, what would his goal be? Yes, that doesn't, yeah. And, and I agree that that doesn't, yeah, that was also my, like, so why is he doing this? Like, what is, because he's just silently walking towards her in an intimidating way. Yeah. And unless the idea is that he thinks he's being seductive, but it, I don't think that's the case. It doesn't seem like that's what he thinks he's doing. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It is, it's very strange. And again, I, 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 it does, it is off-putting. Like, it does make you... Oh, yeah, it's very off-putting. Yeah, in but a like, similar way. But, like, I don't understand his motivation. Yeah, it's just for, for the actual character, I'm not really sure it makes a lot of sense. But, yeah. Uh, Charles never attacks Mary Cat in the book. This is not a deal breaker for me in the movie, but it did feel like a little heavy handed. To have him, like, physically. To have him, like, her. physically yeah. get into an altercation with her. Yeah. I think they just felt like they needed to really up the stakes at the end. Yeah, to, I, I agree. To give it more of a crescendo to the conclusion. Um, and in in the most Hollywood change, um, Maricat does not kill Charles. <laughs> Oh. At the end of the book, um, a very uh, movie kind of ending, yeah. Um, and particularly like which movie kind of ending where they like kill him and then bury, bury him in the, the garden. I mean, practical magic, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, but that that does not happen in the book. He does come back at one point and like tries to get them to let him back in the house, and they just don't answer him. They just yeah. ignore him, and he ends up leaving. Yeah, and then that's huh. all that happens okay. with him. Yeah, again, that feels similar to the last point of just the yeah. movie needing a more the movie needing to, to movie. Yeah. Um, my last note here. Um, as ever, I am not a huge fan of ending a piece of media with the main character starting to write a book about their experiences. Um, I'll allow it in Lord of the Rings, but I I'm not a huge fan in general. Uh, I liked it in, and now I can't. It's been so long, but in the um. At the end of spoilers for the 2019 Little Women, doesn't she, isn't Little Women God, written by don't. her in that? Because that, that was the whole thing where she, uh, she goes and she gets it published and then, or something like that. I can't remember. What well, doesn't I remember it, liking isn't there the ending like of a, the, the, There's like a last minute reveal that the whole last scene where she runs to, yes. to get what's his butt off the train was actually the end of her book and yes. not what really happened. Yeah. Which I would not count as being the same as okay. the, the main character like sitting down to literally write a book and like repeating the opening lines from okay. the movie because now they're writing their book. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right, time to find out what Katie thought was better in the movie. My life has taught me one lesson, Hugo, and not the one I thought it would. Happy endings only happen in the movies. I really liked seeing Constance's room in the movie. Mm -hmm. We never see her room in the book, and I liked all of the visuals indicating that at one point in her life, she was really interested in the idea of traveling. Yeah, she has always, like... Like she has like the the snow globes and like the postcards and all of the like travel uh, paraphernalia around her room. I thought that was a really interesting thing to add. Yeah, it definitely helps uh, motivate her falling into Charles's. Yes. Like, you know, like under his spell, under his spell, because he's he 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 keeps alluding to like taking her away, taking her to travel because he's Mm -hmm. traveled and and, you know. So he says. So he says, yeah, obviously. Um, but yeah, so it it gives a a reason, a little bit of motivation, subtle motivation for why she yeah falls under his spell. Mm -hmm. 
I liked. I don't the, think you. I will say I don't think you necessarily need it because he just seems like the kind of person who would be like, like kind of easily, easily manipulated. Swayed. Yes, yeah. I agree. <laughs> uh, but again, there's a lot yes. of the house that we just don't see yeah. in the book because yeah. Miracat doesn't go into those rooms. Yeah. So I thought it was really fun. No, and it makes per- it's the exact kind of um, thing you should absolutely include because again, it's not necessarily needed, but you're gonna you gotta put something in a room if yeah. you're gonna see it at all, and that makes tons of sense. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I liked the creepy piano music throughout the movie. I thought it was very atmospheric. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the book did not come with creepy piano music. <laughs> it's true. Uh, there's an exchange between Maricat and Constance shortly before Charles shows up, where uh, Maricat thinks that she hears her father in his room. She goes to Constance. She's like, I heard father in his room. And Constance says, they're gone. And Maricat says, I feel him coming back. Mm. And I thought that was like a great creepy way to for- foreshadow yeah. Charles showing up. Yeah. Uh, I also liked having Charles show up while Mary Cat is on the unexpected trip into town. Yeah. In the book, he shows up while she's like off being semi feral in the woods. Mm. Um, but I-, I liked the added layer of like this thing has disrupted her usual routine. Yeah. So she already feels unsafe. And then, lo and behold, when she gets back, there's this demonic presence in (laughs) her home. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I liked the little scene of Charles mansplaining to Maricat how to plant something. I thought that was that was a great little addition. For his character, we see uh, Constance playing a piano at one point during the movie. In the book, she plays a harp. I liked the change from harp to piano. It's it's giving gothic. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, for sure. Not that a harp can't give gothic, mm. but like, you know, the piano in like the center hallway with the staircase yes. going up and yes. like the skylight. It's it's giving gothic mansion. Yes. Which I also really liked that shot at the end of the film where uh, I think it's during the fire, or right before the fire or right before everybody shows up where we get that top down shot through the stairwell and mm-hmm. Constance like wanders into the shot and like looks up at the skylight, like at the camera. I thought that was cool. And there's a little moment um, when the house is on fire where uh, uncle Julian just goes into his room and locks the door. And he's like looking at a photo of his dead wife as his room fills with smoke. I did not even know. I that. thought that was really, that one got me, mm-hmm. got me right here. <laughs> Uh, and then another line that I liked, thought was kind of funny, um, when after the fire and everything and they have sequestered themselves in the house, uh, Helen Clark and her husband come by to try to get them to like come out and go home with them. And uh, the Helen Clark is like, well, break down the door. And her husband's like, every window is broken. I'm not going to break anything <laughs> else for Christ's sake. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about what the movie nailed. As I expected, practically perfect in every way. So first off, I had no idea how this movie was going to work without a voiceover. So I was I was glad to hear that they included at least some of that, because I think Maricat's inner monologue is really essential to this story. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the movie included enough of it. Yeah. But I was glad that they at least acknowledged how important her perspective and monologue is to yeah. making this story work uh, the book begins very similarly to the movie we kind of like start in one place and then jump back and catch up to ourselves although without the repeating visuals at the beginning and end of the movie it's a little less obvious in the book mm. what's going on yeah. uh, because Maricat starts her narration out and it it's not super obvious at first that she's narrating after the events of the book but that becomes more clear as the book goes on. I would say it's not also it's also not obvious in the film necessarily yeah. until we jump. I mean, literally, we get a title card that says last Tuesday. So like it becomes right. very clear very quickly. But when it opens, you don't know necessarily yeah. when this is taking. You know, we have no idea. Uh, Mrs. Clark does bring Mrs. Wright to tea unannounced uh, and they try to convince Con- uh, Constance to reenter society. Uh, and then Uncle Julian does his little uh, macabre show and tell yeah. in the dining room. Um, the movie only did this once that I caught, but there is a repeated refrain with Uncle Julian throughout the book where he asks Constance, 
he'll he'll be like talking about the events of mm-hmm. of the poisoning and he'll just like look up and be like it did happen didn't it yeah like he's and almost unsure yeah. if it and yeah. Constance will be like yes it did yeah and I only caught that once in the movie but it happens only, several yeah, I, times I, in yeah. the book uh Charles is pretty spot on he's just immediately this like loud disruptive presence who doesn't make any effort to under actually understand these people or their lives yeah uh, he just wants their money just there for their money yeah. Right? Marquette does try asking Charles to leave. She she gives it the old college try, asks yeah. him if he'll go. Yeah. And she does destroy the room that he's staying in, uh, very similarly to what we see in the movie. Like she drags in all the sticks and the leaves and everything and um, dumps water on his bed. Mm-hmm. This is briefly mentioned. I don't know if you're going to, you caught it. I but, noticed this line. Yeah. Here. But Uncle Julian at one point, says that Maricat died in the orphanage yes, during the line. trial. I think that's might have been what spark or sparked my question yeah. earlier about like is every, what is Ju- like does everything he say just sound like nonsense like cuz I was like I don't know what that is in reference yeah, to Yeah, like he's... there's I there's a lot going on here and you are kind of meant to question like you know, does he just not know what's going on or, or is or is there some, or weirder, is there some truth weirder, or, weirder truth to this yeah, here? Yeah, stuff he's saying, yeah. There's a scene in the movie uh, where Maricat imagines slash hallucinates her parents saying that they love her and that mm-hmm. she should never be punished. That is from the book. And th- that's also something that I would count as evidence towards Maricat having that motivation yes. to poison yeah. her parents. Absolutely. The, the scene, I didn't super love it in the movie. The scene in the book is very chilling. because yeah. She's like imagining this whole scene where her parents are talking about how much they love her and how she's their most beloved daughter. And it's so laced with anger and malice that it's, it really is very chilling to read. Yeah. I think it worked okay in the film, maybe not perfectly, but it was one of the little details that I loved in the film um, is that they have them sitting in one of those conversation chair things, you know, talking about those if, if you don't know what this is, they're uh, old furniture things where it's like a it's like a, a wooden chair that has two seats, but the seats are facing opposite directions and they're like next to each other. And so that people could sit at them and in them and like talk to each other. Yeah, you would be like kind of facing, kind of facing each, other. each other, but not really. Yeah. Whereas like on a bench, you're both, you're facing, both facing the, the same, same direction. direction. Yeah. If you don't know what it is, just, just Google like a, conversation chair yeah. and you'll understand immediately. Yeah, but they're sitting in one of those. And it's just very fun because it's such a very like it's such an old timey weird yeah. thing. Yeah, that, yeah, they don't make those they anymore. Don't, they don't make them like that anymore. Yeah. I'm sure they do. I'm sure you can get, I'm sure, honestly, I'm sure like very fancy furniture. Like I'm sure you could get one somewhere, but well, and it wouldn't even surprise me if it's still a thing, like among like rich people, furniture, like those, you know what I mean? I wouldn't surprise me if like luxury furniture, those weren't super uncommon, but they're not a, which to be fair, these were, they were, I think they were primarily in like, right. It's, yeah. It's a very like Gatsby esque yeah. piece of furniture. Yeah. Well, I, I also think of like, uh, the, uh, what we just, um, like Bridgerton, like, like mm-hmm. Regency kind of like they have those kind of like, cause I remember seeing those at like, I think the art museum in St. Louis, the art museum in St. Louis has a furniture floor, right? Am I crazy? Yeah. Like a furniture display that's been there forever. And I feel like there was several of those. Mm hmm in the art museum of st louis i feel like that may have been the first place i ever saw them but i remember i feel like i remember them looking sometimes like they belonged in like a regency yeah <laughs> like manner <laughs> or yeah. whatever but we ever been to the art museum together i don't think we, we should have. go to the art museum yeah, I, I do like the art museum anyway um back to my notes here uh the, a line from constance as the house is beginning to burn down she says we just cleaned it it has no right to burn yeah. Yes, I do remember that. I, that was a good line. Yeah. I, I chuckled at that one. Uh, and Charles trying desperately to steal the money in the safe during the fire mm-hmm. slash mob, just bound and determined to get out of there with that money. Yeah. Uh, another line from Constance when people start bringing them food, she says, "We're the biggest church supper they've ever had." I I really I heard that line. I remember that line from the movie, and I really liked it because it was dripping with a level of. Um, 
passive aggression at church yeah. people that yes. I really enjoyed. Uh, passive aggressive disdain. Yes. Yeah. For church people. It's like, oh yeah, no, they love to get together and cook up a big church dinner for people. Probably the people they hurt. Yes, the people they are already out care, you know, they're yeah, exactly. They're the reason that they needed yeah. to cook us a church supper, but they get to pat themselves on the back for being so gracious and accommodate, you know, being so generous and stuff like mm -hmm. I it just a lot of subtext <laughs> to that line that I really enjoyed. Uh, and my last note here, we already kind of talked about this, but uh the exchange I wonder if I could eat a child if I had the chance and I doubt I could cook one mm -hmm. is from the book. That line really got cracked me up because it was the thing that that spurned my like, oh, this whole thing is just a witch yeah. origin story. That like, exchange oh. really solidifies yes, really the like, witch Oh, it like chunked into my head. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, no, it's, uh, this is just the witch origin story. That's all this is. OK, yeah, right. Cool. <laughs> all right. We've got a handful of odds and ends before the final verdict. This is a little detail, but it cracked me up, is that the the opening, we started the film and the opening production company logos popped up, and these were like some truly comically bad opening I'm production I'm mad that I missed these. Company I, logo I did not, I was not paying attention. They reminded me of the kind of uh, like company production logos we see at the beginning of like good, bad, or bad, bad movies, mm -hmm. where they're just overly, pr like overdone and overwrought and not well designed like yeah. it's hard to explain you can just <laughs> tell a cheap bad production company logo versus like you know like obviously like all the like the, the the classic ones that you're used to seeing all have like there's usually like a kind of a simple elegance to production logos mm -hmm. good ones at least the ones you remember like think of the a24 logo whatever um those ones you know or like the the with the star flying what is the uh paramount or whatever like yeah. you know all of the ones that are like really well known are like either very like grand and beautiful or they're very simple like the a24 one or whatever there's the ones that are like <laughs> they look like a weird like pre-purchased asset from like a a mm -hmm. stock video like <laughs> thing or something uh and there was like two of them at the beginning of this one and i was like that's interesting uh which would make sense that this uh, maybe that this film was because we talked about i couldn't find like a uh where this film like it didn't have a box yeah, office like this film was and like i still a don't ghost. know where this film came out like nobody i've never heard anyone talk no, about this yeah. film i which is like wild to me because shirley jackson's a pretty well-known yes. writer at least in america and yeah the haunting a hill house was yeah what yeah why, why hasn't anybody ever brought this movie up very interesting yeah very weird yeah i, I will be well again i think part of it is that it's just kind of like a, a hard movie to sell for one thing like again you watch this movie you get done and like even i somebody who like can appreciate what the movie is yeah and like kind of enjoyed it still don't think i would recommend it to like anybody like not anybody very few people would right. i recommend this movie to and even then i would recommend it very tentatively because again i didn't love the movie so like i, I don't know. i mean i agree but i still think that the sheer level of this movie's non-existence yes, anywhere is very, is very weird yeah it's but again it, it, it's not like it has nobody in it it's yeah got sebastian sand it's got alexander daddario it's got i mean and not, not i mean not just sebastian stan but sebastian stan at the height of Post, marvel this, fame this is in the middle of yeah Infinity War and all that stuff, I think, right? Like, this came in 2019, right? I think yeah. it's, yeah. So, like, 100%, like, yeah, he's, he'd just been in all the Marvel movies. Yeah. Tons of people, or, you know, Chris McGlover's not nobody. Like, again, it has people in it. It's very interesting that it just, zero people talked about it ever. And it had yeah. seemingly had no box office and was seemingly like put it out got by buried. production companies that were, but like. But, like, the, and the, weird, the other weird thing is, like, it was not super great, but I don't feel like it was bad enough to get buried. No, I, I think the thing truly is that it just, I bet it just never got picked up anywhere because it, it's hard to sell. I don't know how you sell this movie. Again, you, well, to be fair, you sell it with Sebastian Stan. It's the only yeah. way you sell this movie is you go, look, and uh, Alexander Daddario, you go, look, but, but you would have to sell it as a different movie. Well, you wouldn't have to, you could sell it however you want, which is a thing that they do sometimes, but I, I think it would end up, I don't know. I can understand why somebody watched, uh, an executive would watch this movie and go, I don't know what to do with this. Just, yeah, we're I not, guess. We can't sell it. I don't know. It, yeah, it is interesting, but. Well, we're covering it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There we go.
Uh, I really liked the vintage aesthetic mm-hmm. in the movie. I liked the set and the costumes and and, and the whatnot. Yeah, no, I, the, I agree. The, and the vintage I, I thought, vibe. As I mentioned earlier, I think it, it's it's clear that it seems to take place in the past, but it's like mm-hmm. a nebulous, non-specific. Yeah, it's it's kind of vaguely past. like fifties, sixties, mid-century, but also looks more modern to me. Like there's yeah. elements of it that look more modern than that to me. Like I, maybe it's just like. Well, for one thing, I thought Thaisa Farmiga's uh, wardrobe that she wears, like the whole movie, looked like she was dressed in twenty twenty. I agree. Like yeah. her out, like that button down like, shirt the, the with the shorts. Down with she the looks mushrooms. like a hipster or something, like from like <laughs> L.A. or something. Yeah. Like I, I don't know. It was like a very strange wardrobe that I don't know if that was intentional or if it was just based on something historic that I'm unaware. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a person in the 1950s dressed like that. I don't know. Uh, Like, again, it just looked like a very modern person. But I, again, I think that's intentional. I think it's vaguely or intentionally because it's called, we have always lived in the Uh castle. I think it's intentionally out of time. Like, I think that's on purpose because also some of the little elements of like the stuff you see in the film does, it feels more modern to me. Like, I don't know, like specific, my next note was just random, but there's the, they had the tap in the kitchen looks to me like a more modern tap, but mm-hmm. they have this tap, which I thought was very interesting is, and to me, I swear it's backwards. The, so the, she keeps using it and it's, the, it, the, it's one of those with like a long, like lever handle. Uh-huh. Normally the, the lever handle on those is facing you. Yeah. And like 99% of sinks I've ever used like that in the movie, it's backwards it's facing away from her but it's this big long lever it looks very strange did you not notice that i noticed that it looked weird but i didn't clock specifically what was i making think it's it look particularly weird. weird because i think it's like the exact tap my parents had like uh-huh. growing up and it was the opposite like the handle was literally flipped 180 degrees from how i was used to it so it looked huh. particularly strange to me and i was also i was kind of wondering if that was some of those little details were intentional like i don't off, know like, what that would be not about. meaning anything specifically but just creating a a sense of unbalance of unease of like things uh-huh. are off like like yeah. little subtle things that are off that are not again not like super obvious things but just little things that make that maybe you don't even notice but just like kind of slowly create this ambiance of like yeah of things being off mm-hmm. or wrong or weird i don't know anyway i just, it was driving me crazy every time I saw that tap. I was like, that is not what the, that's not how the taps work. Why, why is it backwards? I mean, that is, you can put them on that way, but that's, I, I've never seen a tap designed that way to have it be backwards like that. I, again, mm-hmm. maybe I'm crazy, but. Uh, I really liked the underground shot of all the random things buried amongst the tree yeah. roots. I had the exact same note. I, I loved that shot where the camera kind of moves past all this stuff because it's a practical shot too, uh-huh. I think. It doesn't look like CG to me. It looks like they literally just buried a bunch of stuff against like Plexi or something. I don't know how they did it, but it just looks like an actual practical shot of a bunch of stuff buried in dirt that they figured out a way to shoot uh, practically. And I, I thought it was really cool. And again, it reminded me of some of the stuff from like Blue Velvet and stuff of the the things under the surface. And, and mm-hmm. I think that would look terrible if it was CG, like it had yeah. to be practical. The music, I don't know if you noticed this, at times was a little on the nose. I don't know. What, uh, what do like, you mean? A, there was one in particular where uh, Charles and Constance are interacting. I think it's where they're like dancing in the living room or something. And the music is this very loud, like, ni- 1950s style song. And somebody's singing about daddy's home. Oh, yeah. No, I think that was very intentional. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I think it was, yes, it was no, obviously, intentional. obviously intentional. I actually didn't mind that. I, I didn't think it was too on the nose. I think it was on the nose in a way like to me, it worked. Yeah, it's very on the nose, but I thought it worked for the scene. Like it didn't take me out of that moment. Fair it just enough. reinforced how weird and creepy this all was. <laughs> I, I, I thought having it be that explicit act like because oftentimes I would agree with that. But because it was diegetic. I actually thought it worked better. Like if it had been non-diegetic music, mm-hmm. I think that would have made me roll my eyes. But the fact that they're listening to it in the scene just made it creepy and weird. Right, yeah, you know what I mean? Enough. Like, yeah. cause, cause usually my complaint with that in the movie is like, if we're watching a movie and it's like, I think I talked about this like Forrest Gump or whatever, where it's like, it's, it's non-diegetic music. It's just like the, you know, they're playing music over as the soundtrack over the film if the lyrics in that are too on the nose with what we're seeing in the film, it can feel cheesy and like 
corny, like, like, okay, really, that was the best you come up with. But I think in this instance, because it's literally in the universe of the film and they're listening to it, and the fact that they're like, she's not, she's oblivious to what is going on here makes it creepier to mm -hmm. me. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. in that instance, I think it works. Again, if it hadn't been diegetic, I think I would agree with you, but. I thought everybody um, was fantastic in this. Like mm -hmm. all the performances yeah. I thought were really good. Sebastian Stan uh, needs to play villains more. Mm -hmm. I think uh, hopefully he does get a chance to do that more now. I don't know if he's, I guess he's still in the movies or I don't, I don't know. I don't know. He was in the TV show that, so I assume he's going to still be around. I can't remember what happened at the end of Falcon and Winter Soldier, but I assume he's still going to be in the movies. He's not dead. I don't think so or whatever. So I, but um Hopefully he gets to start doing some other stuff because I think he was really good in this as like a weird, creepy yeah. villain guy with like who presents as like this very handsome, dashing guy. But under the surface is like fucked up little weirdo like I <laughs> <laughs> more of that from Sebastian Stan. As we just learned, we just saw Furiosa on Friday. As we just learned more of Marvel characters being fucked up little weirdos. Uh, Chris Evans, great in Knives Out. Uh Chris Hemsworth crushed it as uh, Demento and Furiosa, uh, and Sebastian Stan is great in this. Again, just cast them as weirdos. Just let them be weirdos. <laughs> yep. But uh, I really uh, enjoyed uh, Alexandra Daddario, like the the smiling through gritted teeth thing yes. she does, like yeah. the whole time. She just has so much, and like her eyes, the way she's, you can see the pain. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. she's smiling. It it's the the desperate desperation to appear happy and normal when everything's fucked up i just thought was yes and like the implication at certain moments that she like almost can't help yes the grin yes that comes on her like face. it gets bigger when things get worse yes. like it's just like she has yes. to just like yeah yeah no I, I thought it was great and it like it could easily have gotten to a point where it felt like one note or or like kind of cheesy or uh, you know like oh is that all you're gonna do but it didn't to me it just worked the whole time and and i think part of that is the way it fluctuates and the way it like she gets like more manic as mm -hmm. things get worse and like there's times where horrible things because that was one of the the scene where charles is like attacking mara cat like on the stairs yeah she's like almost like laughing like she's yeah. like she's grinning so much it almost seems like she's like giddy but she's clearly not i don't know i thought it was just incredibly interesting and like a, a perfect performance for that character and like what she's just hiding all this shit underneath and is just plasters this grin and this like very fake smile on the whole time that is very obvious but i don't know i thought there's a lot of subtlety going on there that worked really well but yeah i thought again everybody i thought was yeah. really good uh there was one moment that kind of cracked me up at the start of uh, when the villagers start like ransacking the house and there's this <laughs> one little like middle-aged woman who's like all done up like 1960s style <laughs> and she has this. her little hat and she has her little purse like daintily on her arm and and her little gloves and she just like walks in and seizes a single curtain and like daintily tears it off the curtain rod anarchy <laughs> sent me yeah good good uh and then my final note um i so i just recently watched um a mini series called sharp objects it's on hbo or max it's on hbo max uh it's a it's based on, it's a it's a mini series single season mini series that was adapted from a gillian flynn novel uh who did gone girl which mm -hmm. we've done on the show um but it was it after watching i watched that series i don't know it was about a month ago now Watching this after watching that, it became so incredibly clear how big of a fan of probably Shirley Jackson yeah. in general Gillian Flynn is. Oh, holy yeah. shit that the Sharp Objects remind and I don't want to spoil anything. It's a great series. Highly recommend Sharp Objects. If you like murder mysteries and that kind of thing, um, that are like very like fucked up character explorations, which is what you know, like Gone Girl or whatever. Um I thought it was really good. Amy Adams is the main character or plays the main character in it. Uh, it's also, if you're from Missouri, it's based in St. Louis. She works at the post. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, they never say the post oh, dispatch, no. but she works at a, 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 a newspaper in St. Louis. I assume it's supposed to be the yeah. post dispatch. It seems like, but she's like a reporter and she goes back to her, like her little hometown. Uh, it's a made up town in Missouri, but like a little bumpkin hometown mm -hmm. in Missouri uh, to investigate 
the, the a murder that transpired. So much of that reminded me of this. It's about family. It's about trauma. It's about sisters. It's about it's. I was like, okay, yeah, no, the hundred percent Gillian Flynn read. Uh, we have always lived in the castle and decided I'm going to make my own version of that. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoyed this story at all, book or movie, I would definitely recommend checking out Sharp Objects. I've not read it. I've only watched the miniseries, but it very similar energy and vibe going on there. Um, and I think at least for me, I thought the series was better than this movie was in terms of like delivering a satisfying overall. Mm hmm story it's different uh but like i i thought that was a more complete like well-crafted entire story and narrative than this one was but very similar in lots of ways so before we get to the final verdict we want to remind you you can do us a giant favor by hanging over to facebook twitter instagram goodreads threads any of those places interact we'd love to hear what you have to say about we have always lived in the castle you can also help us out by dropping us a five-star rating writing us a nice little review on apple podcasts or spotify or youtube or wherever you can rate and review us uh, i think uh, like google maybe or definitely facebook you can drop us a five-star rating and review any of those things and if you would really love to support us you can head over to patreon.com slash this film is lit support us there uh for a few bucks a month uh get access to different things at different levels including bonus content at the $5 level and priority recommendations at the $15 level. Go check that out on Patreon for more information. Katie, it's time for the final verdict. <laughs> Sentence fast, verdict after. That's stupid. As far as adaptations go, We Have Always Lived in the Castle is kind of an interesting case. On paper, the film is very, very close to the book. There isn't much left out, and the only huge change is Maricat killing Charles at the end, which, as I said, is also the only change that feels very Hollywood to me. And the movie isn't bad either. It's not super creative, but it looks pretty good. I liked the vintage aesthetic, and I thought it was well acted. I liked Taisa Formiga's Maricat, I enjoyed Alexander Daddario's manic grinning take on, on Constance, and I thought Sebastian Stan had a pretty good turn as the story's villain. But something about it that I can't quite put my finger on fell flat for me. Despite being incredibly similar to the book, the movie just didn't hold up to it and ended up feeling thin and insubstantial. I enjoyed the movie in a, a mild, passive kind of way, but at the end of the day, I would rather revisit the book than the movie. And for those reasons, I'm going to give this one to the book. All right. And yeah, just to tack on real quick, I, I think one of the reasons for me, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but when we were discussing your final verdict uh, earlier in the day, I think this lends itself, at least the way the movie was presented, to reading better than watching. Uh, yeah. As much as I enjoyed a lot about the movie, I think... I think being able to go in and reread things and really dig into like all of the strangeness of mm -hmm. the story by if you need to reread a passage and stuff like that, I think would work really well. And I just I don't know if it was completely yeah. there. in the film. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that we kind of continually discover on this podcast is that sometimes stories are just better suited to a certain medium. Yeah. And there doesn't always need to be like a specific concrete reason for yeah. that. Sometimes things just work better as a book or as a movie. Yeah. Yep. Katie, what's next? Up next, we are switching gears and we're going to talk about Red, White and Royal Blue, mm -hmm. a novel by Casey McQuiston and 2023 film. Uh, it is a romance. Mm -hmm. It is a... A, a LGBT, it's a gay romance. Gay romance. I I didn't want to call it gay specifically because I haven't read it yet, so I don't know if I'm committing oh, uh, like yeah, I, bisexual erasure or okay, anything fair, by sorry. saying that. My apologies. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but yes. I, yeah, I thought it would be fun to do something for Pride Month. Uh, Pride Month content tends to be few and far in between, just based on what kind of media gets made into films yeah so yeah i mean more and more like we could have done more and more, more and more late like we could have done nimona for we probably could have done <laughs> for pride, for pride but yes months, but but it's not it's not explicitly like a that story yeah. necessarily this i so. think will be a little more direct and explicit there you go so okay 
Fantastic. That's our next episode. Red, white, white and royal blue. Come back in uh, two weeks' time for that. But in one week's time, we'll have our next prequel episode where we'll preview red, white, and royal blue and uh, hear what you all had to say about We Have Always Lived in the Castle until that time. Guys, gals, not binary pals, and everybody else. Keep reading books. Watching movies. And keep being awesome. awesome.